We're in a series called The Fundamentals, a basic systematic outline of Christian belief. This is part two. They tell me, and I, again, I want to say this was not my idea or my request. Some people had asked, and then I, I just walk in here, and Derek and that media team, they slap mics on me, they do things, and I just... So these will be, apparently these will be online. You'll be able to hear and, and see me bleed in living color. The doctrine of God. One of my very, very favorite quotes is there at the top of your page. It comes from A.W. Tozer and his, his wonderful, wonderful book, The Knowledge of the Holy. If, if you haven't read The Knowledge of the Holy and you haven't read The Pursuit of God and a third book which is actually my very favorite Tozer book, but you won't find it under this title. The old title of the book was The Divine Conquest. I don't know how many have heard of that book, The Divine Conquest. It's now, I believe, the same book is called The Pursuit of Man, and it's in the resource room. But the knowledge of the holy is just a treatment of the attributes of God, and he does in a book what we're going to try and do in, in one lesson, just with a quick snapshot. And the book opens with this, right near the beginning of the book, this quote. And I think it's so true. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'm not all that impressed at the percentage of deists that there are. People who believe in God as opposed to atheists. Uh... Believing in God doesn't score you all that many points, to my mind, in, in the scriptures. But what comes into your mind when you think about God? That is the most important thing about you. So what we have here, I took nine. Nine basic, quick statements on what we know about God. This is not exhaustive. You should read Tozer's book. Uh, if you're interested, some people are. Uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology has an excellent chapter on the attributes of God. If you want to go way back into, into uh, you know, Calvin's Institutes or Jonathan Edwards, or that's a different realm entirely, and you would certainly learn a lot, but you'll work a lot harder to get what you learn because they don't write for the masses. They write for workers, period. God is a living God. That phrase that I just said, the living God, is the most common description of God in the whole Bible. Just the living God. This is what makes God different from all the gods of the nations and the idols of the people that are lifeless and senseless. Look at Jeremiah 10, verse 5 and verse 10. Their idols, this is the nations, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. That's just such a powerful image, isn't it? Like you can make them out of gold, you can put them in a shrine, you can put them in a temple, you can have people burning incense, you can have people bowing, whatever you want. Here's what, here's what God thinks of it. It's like a scarecrow in a cucumber patch. That, that's what you're dealing with. And they cannot speak. They have to be carried. They cannot talk. Now, the reason, I'm going to finish that verse, but if that, just that phrase, they have to be carried and they cannot walk, sorry. And if you just take that phrase and look at the next paragraph on idolatry. Idolatry is forbidden as an abomination because God can't be reduced to a lifeless image. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Well, why? Why can't we make some kind of image? Because, now back up to that top paragraph, that phrase. Idols, they have to be carried, they cannot walk. Any representation that you make of God, a picture, an image, anything that you create, 
necessarily misrepresents God. Because anything you create with your hands, anything you manufacture, is something you, you take from this building and you move it into that building. You worship it and then you get the dolly under it and you move it over to this building. And it can't speak and it can't talk. And so whenever there's any kind of a, a image or an idol created, God forbids it because what that idol can't represent is that one phrase, the living God. He's not like something that can't talk. He's not like something that can't see. He's not like something that can't hear. He's not like something that can't be somewhere unless you move him there. So that's the fundamental problem with any kind of uh, manufactured religious image. It, as soon as you create it, you've misrepresented the God. Because God is a living God. Let's continue. Do not be afraid of them. I'm in the first paragraph. For they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes. And the nations cannot endure his indignation. So then the the forbidding of idols because he's a living God. The third paragraph. God is the one who gives life and breath to all creation. He was never given his life from another source. Our worship must be such that fits a living God. All forms that have become lifeless, mechanical, and routinely repetitious betray the vital, powerful, living presence of our God with us. Um. And so you'll find God coming to people in the Old Testament because he's a living God. I'm still talking about that. You you don't have to manufacture a statue. Um, You can allow your own worship of the Lord to become... uh, What's the word I want? So uh, routine, repetitious thoughtless, empty, I guess. Even even doing the right things, they can become so perfunctory that they betray the idea that the God you're worshiping is a God who can affect and change and meet and transform you. So that so that even if an image, cuz we don't do this. Like there's no there's no gold statue or anything else in the church and we don't do that. And it's easy to think then that this doesn't apply to us, but it, but it does. You can worship God in such a way that you don't treat him as living. And you don't treat him as living when you don't listen to what he says. Okay, that's just, just one example. Unmoved by his presence. Not thinking about what he might want you to do next, because an idol has no plans for your life. But a living God does. A living God does. So that whole issue of him being the living God. Two. And I hope you know when I say that uh, our worship forms um, can betray the fact that he's a living God. I hope you understand that I'm not saying that, uh, you know, unless unless you're jumping up and down, dancing in the aisles, you're not treating him as a living God. I'm assuming I don't have to say that. But let me say it anyway. I don't mean that. I mean, I think there will be times when one feels strongly moved emotionally. And that should be reflected in worship. I reject the idea completely that any kind of emotion expressed in worship means you're sort of anti-intellectual and just a a wingnut and a goof. Okay? Like, I think we've gone far enough in the charismatic renewal that people know better than that. But what I am talking about primarily is is just just that mental awareness that when we come before God, we're encountering someone who is alive, just as alive as the person you're standing beside and has thoughts and a plan and a will and a way for your life and wants to meet. So I'm not talking about just goofyism. I'm talking about uh, an awareness of, of a God who is vital and living and engaging. 
through his word and by his spirit, wherever Christ is exalted and lifted up. Everybody gets what I mean? All right. Two, God is a spirit. That comes from John 4, 24. Let me just read. This means God is non-material. He's not a creature of flesh and bones. This also means that he is invisible. Unless he chooses to reveal himself in some special way, he cannot be seen by man. He is the one whom no man has ever seen or can see. 1 Timothy 6, 16. Uh, who alone has immortality, who dwells in, in approach, unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So God's a spirit. Be, be slightly careful. Be slightly careful of um, worship songs, even some hymns, but probably more choruses. Just be careful. I'm not trying to... Th- throw water on anything. Just be careful about worship songs, choruses that um, that lead your mind in a direction such that unless you can get a mental picture of God in your mind, you're not worshiping him, worshiping him properly. Because you can't picture God in your mind. But there are a lot of choruses, I've noticed it, there are a lot of choruses that treat God almost like an object of of romantic love. I, I call them the Jesus is my boyfriend courses. And I just love him. I love him. I want to hug him and pat him on the head and squeeze him. And, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, I think we know what we mean when we sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Okay. Well, you, well, you can't. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. You can't. But what we usually mean by that is we want to, we want God engaging our hearts and minds, touching our lives, meet with us, see what God does. But just be careful about, about, there's a whole kind of, uh, direction. And Tom's pretty good. Like Tom and I talk all the time. He'll, he'll bring umpteen choruses and, and God bless him for the hard work he does because it, it's very lean pickings sometimes out there. And he'll bring about six, and I'll go, well, Tom, this one, I, I don't, this one doesn't say anything. We had a conversation not all that long ago. He had another song he was going to teach, and I said, well, Tom, I'm not sure if I'm for it or against it, because I don't know what this song's about. Can you just tell me what this is about? And there was a pause, and he goes, no, I can't. Probably that's not a good one to use. <laughs> so be careful about that. I find, just as an observation, I find... I don't, I don't mean this, this is not a chauvinistic, I'm not a chauvinist, I don't mean it that way at all. I find there's a kind of worship course that is much easier somehow for a woman to enter into than a man. Did I just say something really bad? I, no, I think it's true. I think, I think there's a kind of worship course that, that guys have a harder time with. Kind of those uh, hug and brace and the warm, I just... You know, this, and, and I, I don't doubt for a minute that I think women are more easily engaged in genuine worship. I'm not knocking the worship at all. I think those songs can reach them in a way that's just harder for a man to, to, to enter into. And, 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 look around the sanctuary sometimes and notice the number of women engaged in worship, at least as, as far as we can outwardly measure it. I understand it's an issue of heart. Notice the percentage of women engaged in worship and compare it sometimes with the number of men. And I think some of the songs have something to do with that. I think the guys have a hard time with just, I love you, you're wonderful, you're... I think guys have a harder time with that. Okay? All right. God is a spirit. Three, God is personal. Anybody want to say anything back to me? I felt like I rushed past that. I'll have to repeat the question so they, it'll be on the... Uh, so you won't be on. Don't worry. The camera does not move. Nobody will know if you're asking me a question. But is there anything you... Yeah? Yeah, in retrospect, said, I think if, if it doesn't involve fire, men really can't get into If it doesn't involve fire, men really... Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Don't you just love that? 
A mighty fortress is our God. Like, like, long after we're all dead and gone, everybody's still going to be singing that. It just will. You know, it's so rugged. Having said that, we've got silly hymns too. Like, I, I'm not just taking hymns over courses. There are goofy hymns in there too. You know, when I was a kid, we used to sing, uh, I've reached the land of corn and wine. And that was back when it was a sin to drink wine. So I don't even know what we were going to do with it. You know, I got a mansion over the hilltop. I want a gold one that's silver lined. Did you ever sing that in church? Like, give me a break. Like this. So goofiness can go off in all sorts of directions, in the directions of hymns or, or courses. All right, we kind of wandered there. Three, God is personal. I put this next because when I say God is a spirit, the tendency is to reduce him to something like a, a gas or a vapor. God is a he, not an it. His personality is the source of ours, for we are made in his image. Any reduction of God to a mere force or idea will not stand up to the light of Scripture. The ultimate revelation of the personhood of God is seen in his revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us to address God as our Father and depicted his and our relationship to God as children. I take that to mean when we say God is a person, a personal God, I don't mean he has a body because we just said he doesn't. But he is at least as much a person as I because he made me, he formed me, he designed me. So, so God has a, a mind, he has emotions, he has understanding, he has will, he has joy. A person, but not a physical body. I was at, uh, about half a year ago, at a funeral. It was someone tied in with the church, but it wasn't in our church. It was in, uh, it was in an Anglican church. And uh, a lady was leading the service, did a good job, and found a hymn in their book, it's not in ours, that talks about God as our mother. And she made quite a point about saying, I'm getting now to where Jesus says, our father. He talked about God as father. Her point was that the Bible is sort of patriarchal like that and a little bit chauvinistic. And because God is spirit, I mean, I don't mean to be, how can I say this? I'm not trying to be crass or... Any, God doesn't have genitalia. You know what I mean? He's not male, female. He's, he's God. And so her point was it really makes no difference and we shouldn't make too much of the fact that Jesus taught us to pray our Father and Jesus constantly called God his Father because it could be Mother and it makes no difference. And it was one of those moments where it's... I wasn't ready for it, for one thing, and I'm not maybe brilliant enough, so I just heard it and thought, wait a minute. But I wasn't sure why I was saying wait a minute, and then by then they were on in something else in the service. But it just, it just, it just, something, it just didn't set right. I thought, well, you really have to be careful how you handle this, because, you know, in this day and age, you, you really just have to be careful. And I want to tell you what I've come up with. You can do what you want with it. I think it does matter. Uh, I think it's right and fitting that we address God as Father God, our Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not the Mother. Primarily because that's, as far as one reference in Isaiah, which doesn't say God is mother, but says he, he loves young like a mother loves young. But that's not the same as saying God is mother. Um, except for that one reference, every reference to the Bible, to God, is, is male. Though we know he's not male like men are male. Um, and, and father. And he's he, not she. But Why? That was the thing I was, I was thinking about. And, and to me, it matters for this reason. I, I think we're meant to conceive of God as... Uh, 
He's creator. He's, he's an initiator of life, not a conceiver of life from another source. Do you get what I'm, Am I being too sexual for you people right now? God, God, God initiates, issues life. He doesn't, he doesn't receive life from someone other than himself. Do you get what I'm saying? So when God creates, the Bible makes a big deal. He doesn't just create. He creates out of absolutely nothing. He doesn't, he, there are no other components that God takes into himself to create reality. He, he, he works that way. He, he, he creates out of nothing. So I think for that reason, God is spirit and God is personal but I do think it matters the gender you assign to God. I do think it matters. And Jesus, who, who, uh, who knew the Father better than any of us, he's the one who says, when you pray, go with our Father. Because I think he felt like that's the, that's the image, that's the terminology that for our limited understanding right now, no one's ever seen God. For our limited understanding right now, Jesus knew that that term carries the reality that we most need to know about our God. Everybody understand what I was saying in that? Any comments? Any? Uh... Yes, I'm sorry. Right. So the question is, uh, when Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, is he, that's a fair question, is he, is he using that because he knows that that terminology will help us the most, rather than saying it's an actual designation for what he knows to be true of God? And I, I guess I would lean toward the second alternative, because when Jesus prays alone, he still refers to God as his father so you know what I mean I, I think I think it probably reflects Jesus own understanding of God as well okay all right God is eternal he is the everlasting God who says to Moses say this to the people of Israel I am has sent me to you remember that Moses is going and he's going to go to Pharaoh. He does not want to go. And God says to him, go. And Moses says, well, who will I say sent me? And they have all sorts of gods in Egypt already. And God says, say that I am. He says it twice. I just gave you the one, one quote. I am. And there's something about just the sheer... Um, eternal existence of God and he's always in the present tense I think if you were to picture God and you shouldn't but if you were to picture God it would be a mistake to picture him as someone who is kind of like Father Christmas old, mature white haired because he's always been he must be old wise we think of old I think if you get a picture of God, probably the opposite would be the case. You would think of someone who is perpetually young. Because I would submit to you that age is what happens to people who aren't eternal. Youth is what stays with people who just never, ever, ever age. It gives you a wonderful, just kind of a glimpse into what the resurrection body will be like. You know? I don't know what age we will be. I found in my own life... And you probably do the same thing. Don't you find you reach a certain age and then for the rest of your life you just think of yourself as that age? You do. I can't see. I, I think of myself, you know, so you're learning, you're maturing, you're growing. And then and for me, about, about 27. And I've been 27 ever since. 
And I don't know, you just think about your own life, and, and you, might be, you might be 50, 60, 75 years old, and, and, but you think of yourself probably somewhere as, as 30. But, and so maybe in heaven, who knows, maybe in heaven God will have it arranged that it will just work out that way. We'll all just be right around that ideal age. God is eternal, constantly in the present tense. He, he never wears out. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. Uh, he never grows weary. I mean, the Bible says that over and over again. But I find it such a, a refreshing truth with, with whatever need, whatever problem I'm facing. You're, you're going to God who in his capacity to deal with it is as fresh as he was the very first time you ever brought anything to him. You know what it's like? I know what it's like at the end of the day. You know, and it's 4.30 or you're getting ready to go home and it's just been one of those days and then there's, there's just someone who wants to come in and, and fight with you over why you had the people stand too long on Sunday and they're waiting in the office and you just think, oh, please. And if it had been at the beginning of the day, you had, you had the, the energy and the zeal for it, but now you're thinking about getting home and you know Rini's making roast chicken and I just want to get going and you just you so you approach the situation with something less than your best God never does that God never does that imagine there are 7 billion people on this planet there are probably about 2 point some billion Christians and every one of them have needs and they all call upon the Lord. Like that's, a, that's quite a list. And that, and that with each one, God is able to av- devote the full resources of omnipotence. Omnipotence can't be divided, right? Omnipotence means if you cut it up into quarters, each quarter is as much as the whole was before you cut it up. That's what omnipotence, it's just infinite in power. No limits to it. And I just encourage, you know, don't let this just get sort of be cold theology. The next time you're calling on the Lord and you're relying on, on, uh, on his help and on his grace, just remember that, that it is no, his power is not diminished in any way, shape, or form. And that just as surely as he created the heavens and the earth with just the word of his power, that that's undiminished with each person that calls on him, regardless of how often that might be. God is eternal, always there. Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. Moses says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. The generations come and go and God is just there, our dwelling place. Five, God is holy. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isaiah 6, 3, the angels cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Bible speaks 100 times more about God's holiness than his love. And I think there's a reason for that. The first reason is that it's his holiness that I first need to encounter before I can make a proper approach to him or appreciate what he has done for me in Christ. I I know there's immense love there. But before I embrace his love as redeemer, I need to sense my need as guilty sinner. See, if if I don't have an adequate concept of the holiness of God, then I may love Jesus as an example. I may love Jesus as a moral teacher. 
but I won't love him as savior and redeemer until I sense something of the, the blazing holiness of this God to whom I must come. In my Bible reading, you're probably around the same place. Moses up on the mountain. God meets Moses. They look at the mountain and it says smoke goes up from the top of the mountain and it quakes. And then God tells the people, God tells the people, build, have them build a barrier around the mountain. Remember that? Have them put up a barrier around the mountain. And God says it three times. Don't let anyone come near the mountain. Don't let any of your animals come near them. This isn't God bursting out in wrath. This is God in love trying to protect his people. You, you can't get that close to me and live. It's not possible. Keep them away from the mountain. Don't let anyone touch it. Isaiah sees this vision of God. And the angelic creatures are all around him saying, holy, holy, holy. God is love. The Bible says so. But when they make their approach, they don't say love, love, love. They say holy, holy, holy. And what that does is it just causes us to reach out for, for a redeemer, for grace, for mercy. I said that's one reason. One reason the Bible talks so much about God's holiness is because that is what prepares us to embrace his love and not make it just a syrupy, sentimental love, but a redeeming love for sin. That's the first reason. The second reason God talks, the Bible talks so much about God's holiness, I think, is none of his other attributes are safe without holiness. God is love. If that's all we knew about it, if that's all we knew about God, he's love. He's love, he's love, he's love. He's nothing but love. Would he be a good God if he loved everything equally? Think about it. If God loved uh, the molesting of small children, would he be a good God? He wouldn't be, would he? I mean, to, to love something that is good and beautiful is to hate something that is wicked and evil. Or if we just talked about his, his, uh, his, his mightiness, his omnipotence. But if, what if it were just the omnipotence of a maniacal God? We would be in tremendous trouble. If God was all-powerful and mean... Like, who would want to live on this earth? I wouldn't. But because his love is a holy love, that makes it a beautiful love. It's a, it's a love of righteousness and goodness and justice. Because his omnipotence is a holy omnipotence. Holiness is what, holiness is what holds all the other attributes of God, which can't be sliced up. I know that. But just for examination purposes... Holiness is what holds all the other attributes of God in, in proper orbit, gives them their proper shape, the right understanding of God and, his, and his, his nature. The last paragraph on that page, the final revelation of God's holiness is seen in the coming of Jesus to die for our sins. God is too holy to just ignore them. He can't just forgive sin without punishing sin. And you see how Paul explains that. These are great verses. Romans 3, 25 and 26. Whom God put forward, that's Jesus, as a propitiation by his blood. Propitiation, do you remember from our series on the atonement what that means? There are two words that are important and they are being abandoned. They're being abandoned in evangelical circles. They're being abandoned in a lot of PAOC churches. The two words are expiation, and propitiation. And you have to include them both. Expiation has to do with the removal of my guilt. Okay? My sin. The record of all the wrongs I've done. Propitiation has to do with the, the mending of a relationship with a holy God. Expiation happens to me. Propitiation happens between God and 
me. So his, his wrath is dealt with. It's a just wrath. It's a holy wrath. And it has been revealed and spent in Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. That's God. He might be just. And the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Flip it over. Okay, I've got to pick up the pace. God is loving. You can, uh, I'm not going to read the verse. You can read it where God says to his people that he didn't choose them because they were bigger or mighty or deserving in any way. They were the least, they were the smallest. It was just because of his love. There it is. Just one note, and that is that it's, we do not believe that God is loving in the New Testament and are a God of wrath in the Old Testament. A lot of people have that terribly mistaken notion. Revelation is progressive. The character of God isn't progressive. The character of God is constant. It's fixed. It's the same. He's loving in the Old Testament. He's loving in the New Testament. He exercises wrath against sin in Old Testament. He exercises wrath against sin in the New Testament. Who can forget the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Just for one example. The idea there is there's a, there's a system called, you don't need to know this, but you might if you're in, in, in seminary or something. There's a system called process theology. And process theology teaches that not only is revelation in progression, but God's character. He is evolving. He is maturing. He's getting to be a better God as time progresses. So sure, he was vengeful and wrathful in the Old Testament, but he's, he's smartening up and he's, he's, he's better later on. That, in a nutshell, is called process theology. I like, again, the quote by Tozer in the second paragraph. Since mankind was banished from the eastward garden, none has ever Return to the divine favor except through the sheer goodness of God. God is loving. God is loving. Romans 5, 6 to 8, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Same idea. 7. God is omnipotent. By that we mean all-powerful. I'm going to say in a minute, that doesn't mean there's nothing God can't do. I think that's a myth. All-powerful doesn't mean God can do anything. God cannot make a square circle. Nonsense is nonsense, whether you're talking about God or whether you're talking about anything else. Okay? Um, ah, Lord God, Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen. It is you who have made the heavens and the earth, and by your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. It is important, however, to note that God's power is not exercised arbitrarily. He does not use power to ride over other facets of his nature. You can see Job 8.3 for an example. His power is always used in keeping with his holiness, his love, and his faithfulness. Does God pervert justice or the Almighty pervert the right? That's that reference from Job. And the answer is no. He doesn't do that. He is all-powerful, but his power is channeled in keeping with all of the attributes that he possesses. Eight. God is omniscient. All-knowing. A lot of people are questioning now whether God knows the future. There's a whole school of thought called open theism. The future is open to God, and God doesn't know what you're going to do because you haven't chosen it yet. It's gaining a lot of traction. A lot of traction. Uh, Clark Pinnock embraced that. He's, he's, he's dead now. Greg Boyd. A uh, number of fairly prominent theologians who embrace this. I don't know how you do that. Isaiah 42, 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I say he knows the days of our lives before we were born. Psalm 139, 4 and 16. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book, 
were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Those, those are incredible words. Incredible words. Omnipresent. <clears throat> Last point. Tozer says the word present means here, close to, next to, and the prefix omni gives it universal, universality. God is everywhere here, close to everything, next to everyone. You just can't say it better than that. With regard to, give me one second, on omniscience, I said that some people have uh, abandoned the idea of God knowing the future, absolutely, and the reason they have is is they feel that once you say God knows the future, then you're not free to do anything other than that. So if God knows everything you're going to do for the rest of this day, then you're locked in. You can't do anything other than that. And it's, it's a philosophic mistake. Because, are you still with me? It's a philosophic mistake because foreknowledge... Just for a minute, imagine foreknowledge written there. Take a, a scalpel and just take four away from it. What are you left with? Knowledge. Foreknowledge is just knowledge. Foreknowledge does not make anything happen. It's just knowledge. There, you can't know, unless you're delusional or on drugs or psychotic, you can't know that I'm in Vancouver right now. Why couldn't you possibly know that? Because I'm here. See, where I am determines what you can know about where I am. Not the other way around. You could all sit here and say, we know Pastor Don's in Vancouver. That doesn't put me in Vancouver, right? Foreknowledge is exactly the same thing. It's what you're going to do for the rest of the day that determines what God will foreknow about what you're going to do for the rest of the day. It doesn't make it happen. And it stuns me when you read brilliant people who think that foreknowledge somehow locks in our futures. Our futures are absolutely free in that sense. God's foreknowledge doesn't make anything happen. It's just that he knows what you're going to do. Do whatever you want. That's what God will know. All right? Shalom. See you tonight. <laughs>